Welcome everyone. This is a very special interview with Maya Gastilla. She is actually an undergraduate at uh, the Ohio State University, right? Or is it? Yeah, the Ohio State. Yes. <laughs> Why do they always say the Ohio? I State? don't know. Everyone just does it. <laughs> so there's not like a second Ohio State University. That... No, it's just they always seem to emphasize the the. Okay, <laughs> interesting. So Maya has been doing research in Alzheimer's disease for a very long time. Uh, you looked at her CV, you might think she was a graduate student or even a postdoc or something like that. Uh, she worked in Switzerland doing Alzheimer's research. Um, she's the editor in chief of the Journal of Young Investigators at her school. And, uh, or is that an international organization? Sorry. Yeah, it is international, right. And uh, she's been doing a ton of research about Alzheimer's. She even does her own, writes her own blog, which is called All Science. We'll toast the uh, toss the link in the show notes for you about that. And she's really just trying to get it out there, uh, all the science about Alzheimer's disease. So um, how did you get started in, in research, Maya? And like what drove you towards Alzheimer's specifically or science in general? Yeah, so I started um, research pretty early. I actually started the summer after I graduated high school, like before I started college. Um, of course, I had no idea what I was doing at that point. You know, I just had taken like high school biology classes and that was about it. Um, and so I worked at a children's hospital here in Columbus, um, and I was actually studying frogs and how they develop. Um, fun fact, apparently frogs can regrow their retinas in their eyes if they get damaged. So we were basically studying how they wow. do that, yeah, um, that which would be pretty crazy. useful for humans. Yeah. Um, and yeah, at that point, I was I had really no idea what I wanted to study. I was just happy to be in a lab researching anything. It was such a privilege to actually like get to do science at such an early stage. Um, and from there, I kind of... Um, drifted into Alzheimer's, mostly from my classes. I, for one thing, I didn't know how common it was. Um, it's the number six leading cause of death in the United States, um, which I did not know. And growing uh, and too, right? Yeah, and growing, especially with uh, the baby boomers getting older. Um, and I also just thought it was interesting that we've known about Alzheimer's for over 100 years now, and there still is really no cure um, or even really a super effective treatment. The drugs that are currently out um, can like slightly increase your cognitive status, but they're, they're really not a cure. They don't slow the disease down at all. Um, and so I just thought it was a really important issue um, that somebody needed to figure out and solve. Um, and I found it intellectually interesting. And I just really wanted to get involved with it. So that was why I um, decided to go to Switzerland and study it. There's not a whole lot of Alzheimer's research happening at Ohio State. There's some. Um, but Switzerland, specifically EPFL, the university I was at, um, has a really strong neuroscience program. And so I decided to go over there and work with um, Johannes Graf. Um, who does what's called neuroepigenetics, which is super fun where it's basically like how genes are turned on and off in your brain and specifically how that impacts memory and Alzheimer's disease. Um, and yeah, that was kind of my first time working in an Alzheimer's lab specifically, um, besides a little bit of research I did my freshman year. Um, and from there, I've pretty much been hooked and this is what I want to study for the rest of my life if I'm able. Excellent. Very, very cool. Yeah, it sounds like a similar motivation to my interest in Alzheimer's disease. Um, thank you so much for coming on, Maya. I realized I forgot to <laughs> thank you. I really <laughs> do appreciate it. Like yeah. Um, yeah, it's great to kind of interface with other Alzheimer's researchers from, from all over the world, um, people we've been meeting through this process. And it was really fascinating because it's so complex and uh, we've studied it for so long and yet we're just starting to really figure out what's going on. So uh, yeah, it's still a, a complex problem and, and it's really fun to research. Um, so when you first got into that frog lab, that's really interesting about the, <laughs> the frog divot. I love, I've had pet frogs for my like entire life. I know they're, they're generally like the, kind of the first line of defense when we talk about environmental problems and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, but how, how did you reach out to that first lab and how did you like get, really get into, into that lab and get that opportunity? Yeah, so at that point, all I really knew was that I wanted to study something to do with genetics. At that point, I was just a genetics major. I picked up also a neuroscience major kind of later in my freshman year. Um, and so basically all I did was I was like sitting in the computer lab at my high school and just emailing around asking people if I could come and work for them. And basically I had, you know, I, I made it clear I had basically no skills at all, <laughs> um, but I was willing to, you know, work hard um, and, you know, learn things, try to be an active contributor instead of just you know, basically wasting reagents all summer, which is primarily what I did was waste reagents all summer, you know, as a incoming freshman, that's about all you can do in a brand new lab. 
It's an um, investment. But I was really <laughs> lucky. Yeah, I was really lucky to find um, a PI who was really supportive of um, getting younger students into the lab and giving us kind of a um, first foot in the door, which made it a lot easier for me to then um, find other labs once I started at Ohio State. Um, so it really was just kind of luck and a whole lot of emails. Yeah, the cold calling approach. I, I do recommend that for everyone, but a few people actually want to do that. It's a lot of work, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I probably emailed like 50 labs before I found one that would allow me to start there in the summer. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, it's uh, similar to some of my experiences too. When I realized I wanted to go in research, I was like, how do I do this? And it's very hard to one, find the labs too. Um, once you're in a university, you can kind of tailor it to, to those needs. But yeah, and if you're looking across the country, it's very hard to find labs that you would be interested in potentially. Mm -hmm. So um, let's swing back around to your Alzheimer's blog. What what got you interested in communicating that science with the public? Did you see that there was some misinformation about Alzheimer's disease or you like writing about it? Yeah, so kind of a combination of those. Um, I actually first started talking about Alzheimer's when I joined um, what's called the Junior Committee of the Alzheimer's Association. So a lot of different cities have basically within their local chapter of the Alzheimer's Association, they have um, a junior committee, which is basically a bunch of young professionals who meet once a month and plan events like um, the Walk to End Alzheimer's, or in our case, we have a big charity powder puff football game called uh, Rivals, which raises, I think it raised, you know, somewhere around 15000 or so dollars last year for Alzheimer's research. It goes back to the association. And my role on that committee, since it's primarily non-scientists, was basically just to keep them up to date on all the recent happenings in the field of Alzheimer's research and make sure people knew how to keep their brain healthy and weren't falling for some of like the pseudoscience things which sometimes float around on the internet. Yep. Um, and I really enjoyed doing that and everybody seemed to enjoy um, hearing what I had to say about that and learning about Alzheimer's. And so um, I decided to actually expand that and start this blog so that other people could have this opportunity because I found that when I started looking for uh, resources when I was doing research on Alzheimer's, um, most of the websites out there were either for scientists, so full of like jargon that yeah. nobody who wasn't a scientist can understand, or they were mostly like kind of a caregiver support type of thing. Um, so not so much about the science, which are great. It's great that those exist, but people also need to understand the science of the disease in order to know how to protect themselves and to reduce their risk. Um, and so I thought that was an important niche that wasn't really being filled. And that was what uh, motivated me to start my blog. And it's been uh, really great. I've, I've learned a lot just from kind of forcing myself to write an article every week and learn about a new Alzheimer's topic. Um, and I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from uh, my readers. So it's been a really good experience. I'm definitely going to keep doing it as I go forward. Yeah, excellent. I think I found the same uh, kind of experience with what we're doing as a podcast. I have to do some research for these roundtables, and it really gets me learning stuff that I wouldn't learn just because of classes and, and whatnot. So um, what major are you, by the way, and like, uh, what, uh, what are your favorite courses? Yeah, so I'm double majoring in neuroscience and molecular genetics currently. Um, and my two favorite courses so far have been um, neuroimmunology, which is very interesting. Um, yeah, it was a great class, which, you know, 10 years ago, that word would be like, you know, what, there is no neuroimmunology. They thought the brain was immune privileged, and now it's this whole field. Um, and then my other class that I'm currently taking is psychopharmacology and learning how different drugs can affect Super your brain fun. and how you think, which is great. Um, so those have been my favorite classes I've taken so far. I've learned a lot. Yeah, I, I wish those were available at my undergraduate university. I'm essentially learning a lot about that right now, but it's mostly self-taught. So <laughs> very neat, very neat. Um, so the, this blog, I just want to plug it one more time, ALZ Science, uh, and we'll toss the link in the show notes. Uh, it really is incredible. And I think you've, you've gone into not too much detail on a lot of these posts, but, um, but it does get people learning. So what would you recommend as like a Good preventative measure. I know a lot of people say different things. And are there any things that you've learned in your research for writing the blog um, or just in your research in lab that have changed the way you like structure your daily life to maybe prevent against Alzheimer's, make yourself a little healthier? Yeah, definitely. And so one misconception I've run into a lot is people think, you know, well, my mom or my grandma had Alzheimer's and so I'm probably going to get it too. Um, and for the most part, most diseases don't really work like that. There aren't a whole lot of diseases that are just 100% genetic. Uh, in the case of Alzheimer's, it's only about 20 to 30% genetic, and the remaining 70% um, is due to the environment and your lifestyle choices. So that means most of your risk is actually up to you. It's not determined by your genes. Um, and so a couple of things you can do to reduce your risk. Diet and exercise are probably the biggest two things. Um, a general uh, mantra that neuroscientists say is things that are good for 
your body are probably also good for your brain um, because most of your, not most, a good proportion of the blood flow in your body goes to your brain. And so things that affect your cardiovascular health are really important for your brain. Mm -hmm. Um, So things like eating out of fruits and vegetables, um, not eating too much fats and red meats um, are really important, getting regular exercise. Um, Things like brain games people talk a lot about um, quite a bit for Alzheimer's. Um, As far as I'm aware, I haven't really been able to find a whole lot of really solid science to back those up. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah, yeah, they actually had a lawsuit a year or two ago, Luminosity, for um, claiming on their commercials that they could prevent Alzheimer's when there actually is no scientific evidence to support that. Um, And so I don't think those games are harmful necessarily, but you could be spending that time doing things that are more useful, like exercising, Mm -hmm. uh, social activity, learning a language. Those are much better ways to protect your brain from Alzheimer's and other types of dementia as well. Yeah, perhaps more stimulating than just uh, clicking some animated (laughs) cartoons or whatever on on Lumosity. So yeah, it's kind of a use it or lose it thing. Um, But at the same time, people want to, there is a, a stress factor that some people talk about too. I mean, I always think of it, um, especially in terms of Alzheimer's disease, it's like a spectrum of risks, right? So a lot mm-hmm. of things multiply your risk factor. And we can get it in this more in the roundtable uh, segment, but um, I, I always think of it as like a, a moving car. And, it, you know, you have you have some risk of getting in a car accident always. It's inevitable. If you're going to drive, you know, if you're going to be alive, you might get Alzheimer's. There's some risk. And then if you're going to drive, you might get in a car accident. If you're texting while doing it, that's a more risk. So maybe that's like a poor diet. And if you don't wear your seatbelt, that's that's more risk as well. So maybe that's like a traumatic brain injury exposure or something like that. Um, so, yeah, it, so all these things stack up. Yeah. And it is a lot of the choices that people can make are are impacting their risk. So that's very cool that uh, you're getting that out there and and reaching out to people and telling them, hey, you can change your risk and, and maybe protect against it. Yeah, and I think it's important also not just for older people to realize this, but younger people, because um, currently we think that Alzheimer's starts in your brain something like 20 years before you actually are diagnosed. So that'd be, you know, sometime maybe in your 40s or 30s, you could be starting to develop the signs of Alzheimer's in your brain without even knowing it. Um, And so that's why it's important for younger people to start taking these steps as soon as possible, because if you start eating healthy and exercising when you're, you know, in your 60s, it's still good, but it's not going to have nearly as big of an impact on reducing your Alzheimer's risk as if you're doing it throughout your entire life. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, it's never too late to start, definitely. But <laughs> the earlier you start, the better. Absolutely. So um, what is your research project on right now? We haven't actually touched on that yet. Yeah, so my current research project is pretty much entirely unrelated to Alzheimer's, um, but it's still really interesting and I love it. Um, so currently, I, I no longer work on frogs. I work on fruit flies, uh, also called Drosophila melanogaster, uh, which are really cool. They're um, a really fun organism. I love flies. Uh, and basically what we study is, so neurons have these long extensions called axons um, that they use to send these electrochemical signals to each other. Every neuron is connected to something like 10,000 other neurons, and those connections are via these axons. They kind of act like telephone wires, you could say. Um, and what my lab studies is basically how those axons know where they're supposed to go. Um, so when the nervous system is developing, these axons are growing, and they're making all these connections, and um, we don't know a whole lot about how they know where they're supposed to connect to. Um, and so that's kind of what we're studying in my lab. Um, fruit flies are really useful to look at this because they have these basically transparent embryos we can look at. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you can stain them to look at the central nervous system and look for any defects in um, how the axons are connected to each other. Uh, and so my project is basically um, a genetic screen looking for genes that might affect how axons are guided um, and see if we can find any novel genes. Hmm. So you would, for example, go in and turn off a gene and see if it kind of rewires the brain and the axons are going to the wrong place? Or do you turn on genes? How do, how, how is that? Um, it's actually kind of a, a, a different approach. Because um, so Drosophila people love mutagenesis. That's like their favorite thing, which is basically mm-hmm. just inducing a mutation and seeing what happens. They've done that for decades. Um, and in axon guidance, we've kind of run into this problem where we, you know, we're knocking out lots of genes, but nothing's really happening. We're not finding any new genes. Uh, but we know there are other genes out there because we have these gaps in our models that we don't know what genes mm-hmm. should be there. Uh, and so the thinking is that um, there's a lot of redundancy in the axon guidance pathways. There's lots of genes that do the same things. And the theory is that maybe if you only knock out one gene, there's some other gene that can compensate and you're not going to see any effects if you mutate it. Um, and so the way we're kind of getting around that, um, which a lot of other model, model organisms are starting to use this approach as well, um, is by using a diverse set of flies that have um, basically different, slightly different DNA from each other. Um, so basically, there's this resource called the Drosophila Genetic Reference Panel, or the DGRP, 
uh, where basically a bunch of researchers went out and collected fruit flies from the wild. And then they inbred them to get all these different strains of flies that are all slightly different from each other, kind of like how you and me have different DNA, but we're the same species. Mm. Um, and then we actually look at those different strains of flies and see if any of them just naturally have any defects in axon guidance. And from there, we can go back to their DNA sequence and figure out if we can find the genes that are responsible. Oh, that's super cool. So it's a comparative study rather than um, more experimental. So yeah, it's kind of like a, a GWAS type of study, a genome, what's it, genome-wide association study, right? That's right, yeah. And people do that for all sorts of human diseases, um, like cancer and, and Alzheimer's disease as well. So mm -hmm. that, that's neat. I didn't realize people were doing sur like field surveys like that still. Yeah, there's something like there's more than 200 different fly strains and it's still growing. So, mm -hmm. um, And it, we actually so far have found that some of these natural strains do have defects in their axon guidance. Um, we haven't yet figured out what genes are causing it, but it's still a work in progress. Hmm. Okay. So working with flies, um, I've never actually worked in a fly lab, but I've kind of, I've been in and around them. You grow them up in these like jars, right? And they it, big, just tubes of, of flies essentially. And do you normally um, do the crawling assay where you just see like how quickly they can run up the tube or is that? <laughs> yeah, we've never done that in our lab because just because most of the defects we're looking for are in the embryos and you can't really notice them in the adult. Uh, okay. um, but yeah, I have seen other people do the, the crawling assay. Um, but yeah, we actually have a, a whole room that's just for storing our flies. So we probably have, you know, millions and millions of flies, each in their own little vials. Mm -hmm. um, they eat quite a lot of food. You have to make, I make fly food probably once a week in this like giant 10 liter vat, essentially. It's, it's, it kind of mm. smells like beer when you're making it because of the yeast. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's, it just kind of hardens into this like bread-like substance. And that's what the flies eat. You just keep them in there and they're very cheap and easy to care for. Um, they're a great model organism. Do they get out often, or are these flightless oh, yeah. fruit flies that you're working with? Yeah, they, they definitely can get out. We do have some that can't fly, but they still manage to escape and crawl away sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, most of them can fly. We try to keep them in the fly room, but um, it's impossible to contain them all in one room. Yeah. Um, so sometimes people are out like eating their lunch in the break area. There's always some oh, no. <laughs> flies flying around. And you know sometimes you can tell they're definitely from our lab because they have like certain mutations or whatever, like their eyes are a different color. Um, so you just kind of have to deal with always being surrounded by flies all the time. Get used to it, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, you do. And maybe you could uh, feed some to those frogs or something. Yeah. <laughs> I used to feed. I have uh, some baby geckos at home, and I used to feed when they were really tiny. I would feed them flightless fruit flies. So. Oh really? Um, yeah, they were really. Either. Yeah, they were too small to eat crickets and and most of the worms. So. Um, yeah, maybe I'll have to let you know the next season I get, I get more baby geckos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll send you my flies. Perfect. Uh, that's really, it's really neat to kind of visualize the process of discovery in all these different model organisms. So, um, uh, axon guidance to me is kind of this black box of like how the brain is wired and, and to translate that to humans, how, what would the next steps be essentially? Cause the flies are of course very removed from us. So. How do you think the, the things that you're learning in flies could, could translate to maybe mice eventually or what would be the next steps? Yeah, so uh, the process of axon guidance is actually very conserved. A lot of the same genes are involved in fly axon guidance as in humans. Um, for example, one of the primary genes is called uh, roundabout or shortened to robo sometimes, and humans also have robo. Uh, and other studies have found that there are some very rare um, human diseases that can arise if you have a robo mutation. Mm -hmm. um, and for the most part, we actually don't know a lot about human axon guidance mutations because we've only recently developed the technology to actually look at axons in humans. Um, so the main way you do that is called uh, diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI, which is pretty recently developed. Right. Uh, and so the, the thinking is that probably there are a lot more common axon guidance conditions in humans, and we're just going to find more of them in the next few decades. Um, so one of the human conditions we know about that I think is kind of interesting is called uh, congenital mirror movements. It's a pretty rare condition, uh, and I, I think it usually, uh, it, people can either grow out of it or it's accompanied by a lot of other severe defects and they, children don't live from it. That's why you don't usually see people walking around with this. Um, but basically, this condition um, makes it really difficult to move the two halves of your body independently. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, if you move your left foot, your right foot might also move. Um, and it's a pretty rare condition, but it's caused by defects in how your axons connect. Um, and so... The hope is that maybe by figuring out how some of these genes work, we might be able to help people who have these kind of disorders and figure out what's causing them. Excellent. That's so neat. So it's kind of this cross wiring thing that happens or like a, maybe a short circuit. If, if we Yeah. Were to... Yeah. And we're not entirely sure what causes it because you can also get um, mirror movements 
later in life from something like a stroke. Um, but that's not, we don't think from an axon guidance problem uh, right. because by that point, you know, most of your nervous system is pretty much developed. Um, and so we're not entirely sure what causes it in, in babies. Um, we just know that somehow their axon seems to get crossed over where they shouldn't be. And that causes uh, their signals from their brain to go to both sides of their body when they should only go to one side. That's fascinating. I've never heard of that. Uh, I'm learning... Yeah, it's very rare. I think it's something like maybe a few hundred people in the world have it. Oh, okay. But yeah, I'm sure you could extend this this knowledge to other diseases eventually as well. So um, it's interesting. I didn't realize they were those uh, those axon guidance pathways were quite so conserved. So um, I, essentially, conservation just means we use the same genes in flies as we do in mice and humans. So Maya, you've been incredibly successful in your <laughs> in your like short career as an undergraduate. I think you've done more by now than I had done before I even entered graduate school. Uh, are you planning on attending graduate school? What's the next step for you? Yeah, definitely. Um, so right now I'm a senior. I'm graduating in May. Very excited. Um, and so the plan right now is I have a job lined up at the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. Um, they have a program there called the post Back Research Program, where basically you work there for one to two years doing research. And it kind of helps you just prepare for graduate school, help you figure out your research interests. Um, and I'll be working at a new center at the NIH. It's called the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS. Uh, and so basically I'll be working not so much on basic research, but on translational research, which basically means it's more directly relevant to human diseases and trying to find um, new drugs. Uh, specifically, I'm planning to work on a project involving neiman pick disease, which is a rare neurodegenerative disorder. It's actually sometimes called the Alzheimer's disease of children mm -hmm. um, because it causes a lot of uh, dementia-type symptoms in children. Um, so I'm really excited to work there and be there for one or two years. Um, and then, yeah, after that, I'm definitely planning to go to grad school and get my PhD. Um, long term hoping to go into some kind of research position involving Alzheimer's or other neuro neurodegenerative diseases and try and figure out how we can find treatments for them. Excellent. Do you have any top schools uh, in your mind or you just kind of doing <laughs> research right now? Yeah, so many options. Yeah, there's a lot of schools that have really strong Alzheimer's programs, which makes it hard to narrow of it down. Course, yeah. Um, I'm really interested in MIT and uh, UCSD, University of California, San Diego. Um, but I'm open to a lot. I still haven't entirely decided where all I want to apply. It probably just depend on um, what types of projects people have going on and um, whether I want to stay translational or go back to basics. So we'll see where I end up. I'd like to be California because it's, you know, so nice there. But, you know, it's not nicer <laughs> right. weather than Ohio. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, you and everyone else. No, it's, uh, California, of course, has great neuroscience programs. Uh, you would probably be applying directly into a neuroscience program. or So for myself, like I did an umbrella program where it was general molecular biology or all biomedical sciences. And then from there, I chose a program. But you think you want to go straight into neuro? Um, it's possible. Most of the people who are doing the research that I'm interested in tend to be in neuro departments. Mm -hmm. um, but it does depend on the school. So for example, like another school I'm interested in is uh, Scripps. Research Institute where they have a PhD Absolutely. program where it's basically just like it's just like biology like you can work for any of their researchers so mm. yeah I'm definitely looking at a whole bunch of different departments um, but well, you'll see I'm also looking at possibly pharmaceutical sciences if I want to try and study uh, drug candidates for Alzheimer's um, so yeah I'm open to possibilities nice very very promising career uh, absolutely how would you advise like a high school student, um, for example, I know we were talking about like kind of cold calling, sending out a ton of emails to a ton of professors and just hoping that one landed and someone was feeling nice that day. Um, any other advice for people looking in to get into your field or to get into science in general? Um, how should they educate themselves? Yeah, I think one of the hardest things for me was learning how to read a research paper, mm. uh, which like sounds so easy. Like, you know, we know how to read and, you know, we've probably read like our science textbooks, but it really is so different reading an actual primary article. It's a whole other language. Yeah. It's... Yeah. And like, and you have to learn, like, you know, you don't just like read it straight through. Usually you might, you know, you kind of switch around, like you might start with the discussion at the very end and then go back to the results. It just depends. Um, and you, it takes, it took me probably like a year to really, really get comfortable with reading papers. Um, because the first step really is like, reading a paper and actually understanding what it was about. Mm -hmm. um, and then once you're able to do that, then you can actually get to the point where you're like, okay, do I believe what the author is saying? Like, do I buy their conclusion that they drew from the study? Or do I think that um, I would conclude something else from these data? Um, because re that's really necessary to start, you know, being able to question other people's work and think critically. Um, to get to that point, you really need to be able to read a paper and understand it. Um, it could probably be kind of hard for a high school student to practice that because of paywalls on a lot of these articles. Mm, yeah, uh, that's but true. If you look for, um, open access versions, which a lot of 
um, publishers are starting to move toward now, then you're able to look at them. Um, and yeah, I think just devoting some time to reading papers, thinking critically, um, don't assume just because it's in a paper that's true, there's plenty of false things that have been published. <laughs> Unfortunately um, so, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah that, that'd be probably my biggest tip, is just learning learning how to read papers, and maybe also not thinking that like you're just going to be amazing at it when you first start, because I made so many mistakes, and I still do all the time. Um, and just you know, being humble, being willing to make mistakes, figure out why you made them and try to make slightly fewer in the future or at least like different mistakes <laughs> as you go forward. Because, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, a lot of people start out like, you know, they're in high school and they're like, wow, I got a 4.0. I'm so smart. Um, and then you go into a lab and suddenly you're just messing everything up and you feel incompetent. Um, and you just have to kind of understand that's how everybody feels. Nobody just knows how to do a PCR the first time they try or, you know, load a gel. Um, and, you know, I think it's just understanding that everyone's been there and that you're going to get better um, and just being willing to deal with all that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Learning from the mistakes is definitely a, a huge point. And if you do something wrong, like two or three times, then you're consistent, but <laughs> it's not exactly you know, results oriented. Absolutely. And the, and the, the reading papers thing is, is going to be useful in any field of science. Even if you've read a bunch of papers about frogs and then now you want to read about Alzheimer's disease, it does translate. I mean, some of the language, maybe not so. You'll still have to Google some terms and some vocabulary, but just the skill of being able to dissect a paper and then think critically also about the results, like you said, is super important because people don't always get things right in their conclusions or in their data. So you got to know what looks like good data and what doesn't. That takes a very long time. Still learning myself. <laughs> so um, you... Sound like you worked really, really hard. What do you do to like relieve stress? Uh, or uh, when you get out of lab, like how do you cope with like a really long lab day or all your flies escaped that day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I would say I probably uh, don't have as much free time as some would like. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I do try to at least uh, maintain a healthy lifestyle because as I said, it's very important for protecting your brain from Alzheimer's. And I don't want to be a hypocrite by not following my own advice. <laughs> Um, so I try to like exercise. It's pretty good for stress relief. Um, there's certainly there are some weeks where I just don't have time to go to the gym, but I try to go at least, you know, a couple times a week. Um, and cooking is kind of a stress relief thing for me as well. Um, I think it helps like I, I'm kind of a compulsive scheduler. Like I, you know, I have like a color coded planner and I plan everything. Um, but it helps me to actually schedule in time to relax, like actually physically write on my planner. Like I'm going to relax for <laughs> these two hours and, you know, force myself to do nothing. Yeah. Um, because sometimes, especially when you get into like later undergrad and into grad school, um, there really is like no time where you're like, wow, I've done everything I need to do today. Like there's always something else to do, another paper to read, you know, something to submit for, a, you know, an application of something. Um, and it's just overwhelming if you're just always working on that. Um, yep. That was actually one of the things I learned from when I was in Switzerland is like how to relax more because the Swiss are very good at a work-life balance. Uh, I was amazed when I went there and some of the where most of the grad students actually work like a standard 40-ish hour week, which was amazing to me. Like mm -hmm. most of the grad students here work yeah. crazy hours, That's you know? unheard of here. They'd be like, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, and it was like amazing because like they still seem to get about as much done as we do. And I was like, how is this possible? Um, and it's really just because they, because they take so much time to take care of themselves and, you know, give their brains a rest. They're just like better when mm -hmm. they're in the lab. Like they don't make as many mistakes. They plan right. things better. Their, efficiency, their, their experiments are more efficient because they plan them out in advance and read more papers. Um, and I really found the same thing in my lab. Like I, if I take time to just not think about lab for a while and just, you know, give myself some time to, you know, have inspired thoughts or just, you know, sit there and veg out and do nothing, it's actually really good for my research. So definitely would recommend don't <laughs> overwork yourself too much. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's the other thing I do for fun is I play in the orchestra here at Ohio State. Um, they have something called the community orchestra, which is basically for people who aren't music majors and uh, hmm, don't cool. play like super hard, you know, symphony orchestra stuff. Um, so I play in that and play the violin. And that's also just something I do to clear my head and do something kind of fun for a while. Yeah, absolutely. You made a lot of good points there. I've noticed myself if I'm like putting in a ton of hours, sometimes I feel like way less effective, actually. I'm like, wow, I made all these mistakes. And then like I had to scrap part of this experiment and now I got to restart everything. And so it just feels like I'm working more and more. <laughs> Definitely know what you're talking about when um, you say you should like schedule free time because I just I just finished my written qualifying exam. 
And while I was working on that, um, I also had all my side projects running and stuff like that. And any free time I had, I was always thinking, oh, I need should I should do this. I shouldn't be relaxing. I should do this. And you feel guilty, but you really do need to schedule it. It's important for mental health and just effectiveness in the lab. So just a public service announcement for any of this, <laughs> any of people going through similar stuff. Uh, you do need to force yourself sometimes. I know the impulse to work hard is is good in a lot of ways, but it can it can hurt you in the long run. Thank you so much, Maya, for coming on. Um, is there anything else you'd like to talk about uh, in terms of like myths about your kind of career path or um, what it's like to be a scientist? Uh, any last thoughts for our listeners? Um, I guess one thing I would say is that if you want to be a scientist, that's not one thing. There is no like this is a scientist. Um, there are scientists who work in the lab. There are scientists who are science communicators. Uh, there are people who are in science policy. Uh, you could be a professor, you could work at a company or do biotech. Um, I think once you start at a university, you get this idea that a scientist is just a professor because that's who you see, you know, you see your professors. Um, but just be aware that there there are a lot of options and not, not to just kind of limit yourself to the options that you see around you, you know, kind of explore and figure out what you actually want to do because there are a lot of other options out there besides being a professor. Um, and if you find that you maybe don't want to be in the lab. It's I think it's okay. There's just kind of a stigma around leaving the lab and doing something out in the real world. <laughs> but um, we need those people too. We need communicators. We need policymakers who understand science. And um, I think it's good for people to know that those are totally valid career paths as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so much diversity happening in science career field these days. I, I have programs on it all the time. And it's just it's no longer the academia model that is, is really viable for a lot of people and also appealing. I think a lot of people say, I don't want to live that life and myself partially included. Uh, <laughs> I like the <laughs> idea that there are other options at the end of badges. Thank you so much again, Maya. Uh, this has been great. So if anyone wants to read a little bit more about Alzheimer's disease, learn more about that, it's alzscience.wordpress.com. You also have a Facebook page, right, and a Twitter. The yeah, they're, they're both just at ALZ Science on Facebook and Twitter, also on Reddit. <laughs> oh, excellent, right? Um, and uh, yeah, if anyone wants to reach you, they can reach you at those, those avenues, right, for questions? Yep. Okay, we'll, Absolutely. We'll toss those in the show notes. And uh, thanks again for coming on. Stay tuned for our Alzheimer's Disease Roundtable, where Maya's going to break down some of the new discoveries into how amyloid beta may actually be protective in an immune context. So that'll be really, really fascinating. I'm, I'm super excited to learn more about that because we need to rethink potentially what amyloid beta is doing in Alzheimer's disease. Thanks again, Maya. Thanks for having me.